So that's number one. That then allows me to gain a greater sense of the issues and the concerns from the faculty that are that you know that are you know that work at those different in those different locations. It's also very important that as the leader of the team of the academic team, YAC, that perhaps I'm not just you know, I'm not just holding meeting after meeting after meeting at the downtown campus and ignoring the Franklin location or the Noblesville location, you know, or the Greencastle location. Because I think it's important and I've done this with my own leadership team where we actually go out and see not just not just interact with those who are based at, the, at those locations, but also see what the instructional environment looks like in those locations. You know. So that would you know I would want to sustain that technique, you know, as the vice chancellor. I think that I think that's one way. You know. And then keeping in mind that you know, when we do, for example, I mean, we have structures in place where we talk about how great, you know, the great work that we're doing, you know, as, as colleagues, as cheers for peers. So on my picture today. <laughs> uh, <coughs> that we're not just focusing on what was happening at this, you know, on the Indianapolis campus or the Indianapolis and Lawrence, but that we are an entire service area. So. Appreciate the question. Thank you. Rachel, I think you had your hand up. Yeah. So you talked about stewardship in your vision. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, because you know, we know that Ivy Tech doesn't have an endless pot of money to draw from. We don't? So, yeah. okay. <laughs> so could you talk about how you might handle some of these resource allocation decisions when different departments and teams are going to kind of, if we're all going to want our wants. And our of course, needs. of course. Yeah. Uh, that That's something that we all, that I already do. I don't know if you noticed, but um, our, our our current schools, SE is very large and diverse, and everybody wants something. Um, <laughs> typically, what I try to do in that situation is get a sense. Number one, well, there are two things. Number one, I'm looking at some sort of return on investment. How is it ultimately going to benefit? You know, is it benefiting instruction? If it's something that you know, is it benefiting the students? You know, when it kind of, whether it's a position whether it's funding for professional development, whatever it is, like, what is the benefit? Well, now, when it comes to harder decisions that involve larger part, pots of money, so, I'm, so for example, I'm thinking about my role is if I'm selected as vice chancellor, then the responsibility of the requester is elevated. I'm also then going to be looking at connection to strategic plan, relationship to, to accreditation, those types of factors to, you know, so to make a compelling case so that when I say, all right, it makes sense for us to invest in these funds, you know, to invest these funds in this initiative or in this request, it, we re I really am making the right decision. You know? uh, that's typically how I've operated since I became a dean. That's certainly uh, when I was also, when we were also looking at the Title III grant, even though it was other people's money, you know, and you still have to take, you have, still have to keep in mind, you know, what's the best allocation of funds. I think being on, honestly, I think being on the Resource Utilization Committee has helped kind of deepen um, my appreciation of how those decisions are sometimes made and how sometimes it's difficult to make those decisions. Sir? You mentioned the strategic plan, Rod. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on change management. We have so many things coming down the pipeline <laughs> in terms of getting buy-in, prioritizing, integrating all of the initiatives that are going on. Sure, sure. Change management is very difficult, especially when change comes and you don't expect it. Um, what I have found over the 15 years that I've been at Ivy Tech is the best way to manage change is to provide as much information up front as possible. I think over the years, I've acquired a skill, Sarah, of being able when I'm in a meeting and someone says, well, now one possibility might be this, it's coming. 
or at, least, or at minimum, I need to be able to communicate in some fashion to those who are going to be affected. We have this meeting. This is a possibility. The challenge of doing that, however, is that depending on my audience, then, the, then it becomes, you know, all of a sudden it becomes, oh my God. <laughs> and then everybody panics, you know. So I think part of it is being able to feel out the members of my team to make sure, you know, that I'm communicating, you know, what's coming down the pike. Also part of change management involves thinking through what, the, what support is going to be needed for all effect. So if it's a major change that's occurring, what are the resources? Is it time? Is it space? Is it, is it um, are funds involved? Things like that. So that we can plan ahead, you know. I, one thing I've learned is that with, with any change, there's probably going to be some level of pain. My goal as an administrator is to do what I can, if not to remove it completely, at least decrease it and minimize it through communication and providing resources. That's, that's how I would handle it. Colin, can you tell us a little bit about how K-12 programming for the college dual credit those programs fit into your vision? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <coughs> For one thing, K-12, the, K the K-12 initiative, you, you have a new vice president, right, who is going to take this institution in probably a slightly different direction than what we have talked about related to K-12. K-12, historically, since I've been on this campus, has focused on dual credit and dual enrollment and professor online. What I see happening with K-12, two things. Number one, I do see that there's going to be a much higher engagement uh, and a lot more collaboration I can see between K-12 and enrollment management. I, th I do believe that that is inevitable. You know. I also see, so that's the collaboration piece. I also see, especially related to central, well really the state of Indiana in general, we know that K-12 has now enhanced its expectation of workforce development and workforce alignment. That has now seeped into K-12, <coughs> especially at the junior high and the high school level. There are these tracks that are being developed you know, so that students are coming out with workplace skills. Right? So what that means, I think, for K-12 is there's also going to be a higher level of engagement with the different with the other academic programs related to workforce, I could it would not surprise me at all if somewhere down the line, representatives from K-12 initiatives end up working, you know, either serving on select advisory boards or being a part of that larger larger conversation. Having said all that, dual credit's not going away. And so it's very important that our dual credit faculty continue to feel that they are a part of what we do here at Iowa Tech. So the faculty development piece is not going to heal. So, so that's also going to be a critical part. So that relates to the professional development aspect of it as well. So I could say that all of those aspects, you know, as far as how that fits into, you know, into the vision, you know, Colin, I would say all of that's all that's going to be a part of it. And along with that, I don't think the conversations about early college, about having, uh, you know, about having high school students on campus, creating select programs, much like we did with IPS, I don't think that those are going to go away completely. I, so it's very important that we are continuing to engage our K-12 partners <coughs> and that we're communicating what our expectations are. Um, and also as what I think you have done, along with other K-12, you know, along with the rest of K-12, is then communicating to the faculty who are here on campus and to advising and to enrollment management. So I still see this as being as K-12 playing a critical part, you know, uh, 
I don't, like I said, I don't think it's going away. I do think, honestly, given how, in fact, anything, I would say that one thing we may need to look at is, is the structure. Because what you and Cindy and the rest of your team do related you know, to K-12 is, you know, is um, enormous. And especially now that we're a much larger service area, your, you know, your roles have increased dramatically since we first started, since I first started. Maybe. Over the last few years, there have been a lot of initiatives in which academic affairs and student affairs have worked together yes. um, on different kinds of things, and there are more coming down the pipeline. Um, you mentioned previously the you know, academic advising model, mm-hmm. which is a huge example of that. Yes. Um, what is your philosophy on how to create and nurture those collaborative relationships between academic affairs and student affairs? Well, as a former student affairs professional, <laughs> get for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been my experience that a lot of, you know, when I was working in student affairs, you know, there was very much sometimes a, you know, an attitude of, you know, of us and them. Um, now, I was very fortunate because as an academic counselor at Harper College, we were classified as faculty. So I was really able to enjoy the benefits of both. You know, here's my philosophy on that. If one of our if goal one is student success, we can't operate separately. We need to have conversations. Sometimes we need to have individual conversations within our teams. But ultimately, student success. <coughs> it relates to you know, like the front-facing work that we do is a collaboration between academic affairs, enrollment management, <coughs> and student success. So that's my philosophy. In practice, I want to get back to what Ivy Tech used to be, and some of you remember this, you've been here long enough, where we have the Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, sitting alongside each other, and you know, holding, you know, holding meetings with their, you know, with their teams. That's really critical because information is then being communicated at the same time. There's no complication of, well, I heard from them, I heard from them. It's all happening at the same time. So, what I would expect is that if I'm selected, I'm working alongside Dr. Kaus and Dr. Funk, and we are restoring that element to, to the Indianapolis service area, and that we're having those meetings, you know, to make sure that communication is being communicated consistently and that we're hearing the same thing and being able to ask questions in the room as opposed to relying on emails. Okay. You knew I'd have a, a tough question. Okay. Uh, I want you to tell us about how your vision fits in for the staff. We hear a lot of discussion about faculty, and faculty yes. are important. Yes. But I dare say you couldn't run it without the staff. Oh, I would agree. So, um, you know, it seems that morale is a little bit down. I think that might be even be an understatement. A little bit. <laughs> and I'd like to know your plan for <coughs> possibly turning that around. So you've asked me a couple of different questions. <laughs> Here's what I'll let me, let me start by talking about morale. I've worked at institutions where, where morale is low, and I've been on that side. Typically, I see morale being low for a variety of reasons. Number one, if decisions are made top down, if employees feel that they have no voice, no say, if they feel that they have no control, and if they feel that they are being ignored. Now, some of those, we operate within a statewide system. And sometimes, unfortunately, decisions are made without complete and total vetting. 
and then the train leaves the station, and we do, and we have to live, and we have to live with it. So the question does not become how do we stop the train, but how do we make the ride a bit more smooth? What I would say regarding morale is that if employees, faculty, and staff are feeling ignored, we need to do something to make sure that we're hearing that they are giving a, you know, an opportunity to speak what their concerns are. All right. Now, fortunately, on our campus, we have a couple of different ways that that can work. We have a staff council that has already formed. We also have individual schools that allow staff to, I hope, be able to communicate their concerns to their, you know, to their supervisors. If that's not happening, and I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting the voices, you know, I'm not getting the voice of employees, then I have, then, then that's a problem, and then we need to correct that. I do know that among the direct reports, some direct reports probably do a more effective job of convening and communicating information than others. So part of the communication plan that I talked about earlier would be trying to establish a, a standard by which we can all, you know, in which you know we can all live, with which we can all live. All right. If employees don't feel that they're being appreciated, do we have mechanisms in place where we can showcase good work? I think we do. We just need to be more intentional about it. You know, um, Cheers for Fears is nice. I like it a lot. But maybe there are other things that we can do that are not just limited to twice a year when we have our large academic affairs kickoffs. As it goes to the staff itself, I'm going to assume from your question you were talking about staff as it relates to your position, you know, to your type of position, or are we talking about because because we also have library staff, we also have no, learning, we also have staff. staff in, okay, so staff in general, great. Okay, so what I I think part of what the challenge is is that when we have our academic affairs meetings, we don't talk about. Staff. We don't talk about the great work that the library is doing as being these champions of online educational resources or providing ways for students to be more you know, academically literate you know, or academically responsible. We don't, we don't have those conversations. You know, we hear that maybe in IAC, but it's never brought to the foreground. We have a tutoring center that is certified at the highest level through the College Reading and Learning Association. But I don't think very many people know that. And for that matter, what it means. We can do better as far as communicating that. As far as support staff go, I think it's important to recognize that the, you know, that the role they play is, you know, is critical. And I also know that there have been discussions about the future as far as what that's going to look like. We need to be able to communicate, you know, you know, as leaders we need to be able to communicate that what you know the progress and what's being happened so that there is not that level of anxiety. Because another part of morale that can bring another part that can bring down morale is ambiguity. And if there are changes that we already don't like and then we don't know anything else, that's only going to increase the Uh, well, to piggyback on that, you, know, you said that the ambiguity that can be sort of, you know, um, unnerving. And one thing that you always do in our faculty meetings is to um, talk about any myths or rumors that you can dispel. So yes. I think a lot of us appreciate that. Those of you who are not in faculty, it's great. It gives us an open forum and say, well, I heard that blank. And then we can put that out there. So how could you continue that in um, the vice chancellor role? In the vice chancellor role, uh, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, in our large you know, first of all, in our large meetings, I would I pretty much do the same thing. You know, now I say that now. The, <laughs> we'll see. We'll, I'll see how that feels. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, at the beginning. 
but I would I would want to at least solicit that. Um, I probably also start with um, soliciting that feedback from my direct reports to get a sense of okay, what what exactly are you hearing? You know, I would also, and this is a, this is somewhat of a challenge because we are so big, but I think sometimes we use our size as an excuse. Most of the other campuses within the Ivy Tech system will have one will have something more than just one faculty meeting per semester. Yeah. Maybe there's a way that we have something like a mid-semester, and it's not required. You know, nobody's gonna. You know, there's not gonna be any action taken if you don't come. But it's an opportunity to have not just the program chairs and the department chairs come. You know, that's current. I think that's the current structure now. But for the chance for you know, for I as the chief academic officer to bring together all of academic affairs who's available. <laughs> and kind of number one, take the temperature of you know of my team, but also be able to open it up for some questions. I would also probably I might consider down the line um, taking the newsletter that we do for Sassy and trying to expand that you know and make it an academic affairs newsletter because I think that there is some benefit to that as well. We have about 10 minutes left. Jason? So, in the, in the School of Engineering Technology, so I'll say the long words. Same as. No. <laughs> Advanced Manufacturing, Applied Science, and Engineering. Yes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> as, you know, Fine Arts is, is now in a different school. Mm -hmm. This kind of a different school. Sure. Unfortunately, when I look in the mirror and then look down the hallway at the program level, instructors and PCs, it is all. 45, average 45 go years on. old white male. Yeah. There. Yeah. Exactly. How do we go about helping change that diversity there? Related to that school in particular, there are organizations. That, so that's number one. That there is the National Society of Black Engineers. I'm using that as an example of an organization where you where we can be more deliberate and reach out to those, you know, you know, to diverse groups. There's diverse issues in higher education, and I would likely push for HR to start expanding its reach as far as how we advertise and how we market. Indeed, it's a nice tool, but between diverse issues and even in higher ed jobs, there are ways that you can categorize a, you know, a position as, diver you know, as diversity, even if it's not, not necessarily a diverse position because we're trying to tar you know, target particular groups. And, that, and those are just examples related to ethnicity and race. In, say in, in, that school, you know, in the same school, we also have difficulty as far as representation among women. Indiana Women in Tech, I think, is a good start for us. But I think, you know, when I look at, you know, maybe other institutions, I mean, there are ways that we can recruit women so that we have a much more diverse and equitable, you know, um, workforce. That doesn't just benefit female students. I think it's also extremely important for male students we're going out into the workforce in the 21st century to recognize that not everybody that goes that goes out there is going to look like them. So those are a couple, those are a couple of ways that I would, you know, that I would handle. Yeah, Jason. Tina. Uh, so on behalf of Workforce Alignment, yes, um, we, as you probably know currently work with academic programs, um, not only on offering training, but also offering open enrollment classes for the community. Where potentially a student could, um, sometimes the classes are offered in conjunction kind of with the academic. With the credit side. side. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so a student could potentially get PLA or some sort of credit for those classes sure. afterwards. 
Sure, across, there can be a crosswalk opportunity, sure. Yeah, and so we do a lot of work with academic programs. Um, I was just curious what your thoughts are on um, maybe more collaboration with workforce women in academic programs or what kind of thoughts you had on that. A couple of things come to mind. Number one, I think workforce alignment provides a great, you, I think your area is a great resource, can be a great resource for academic affairs as far as helping to strengthen advisory boards because you're actually out there and connected more with employees. You, know, you may be connected more with employers than, you know, than the chairs have the time to do. So that's one. Also, I'm glad you mentioned about the opportunities for collaborating with the credit side where students can experience, you know, they can complete a certain amount of training that then can either be crosswalked as PLA or in some cases if they're earning a certification, it can be crosswalked as well. Because that then leads to what I call, you know, leads to stackable credentials. So you can then take that credential and then apply it either towards an existing CT, an existing technical certificate, or if that, you know, if that student only earned that credential and then went back in the workforce and decided to skill up, but didn't necessarily want that, you know, those particular area, you know, that particular field, he or she could take the credits earned there and apply them towards, towards an associates in general studies. So there are a lot of ways that I think that we can be more engaged, you know, as far as working with workforce alignment. And I, I'd, welcome, I'd welcome those partnerships. Okay. What are your thoughts on the value of a liberal arts or general studies education? That liberal arts has been criticized in recent years as being a useless degree. It's not. But I'm proof positive that. <laughs> How would you counsel a student or community stakeholder on why a liberal arts education is useful? Here's what I would do. First of all, we have data. I mean, first of all, from an employer perspective, I think sometimes we operate in this mythology at Ivy Tech that employers are saying, no, we just want people trained. We don't care if they can read or write or think critically. <laughs> That's not true. That is not true. You know, the, um, the, the Association for American Colleges and Universities has done, you know, has, has done research that shows that employers are more, much more interested in the types of, you know, in what students acquire in liberal arts education that allows them to be flexible and change because jobs change so quickly. So that's one. So, so first of all, I think we need to dispel some of that mythology. I think the other part is we can do a better, I do believe that we can do a better job as community, as academics in community colleges of placing more of what we do on the liberal arts side within some level of context. You know, so here's an, here's an example. Every single career and technical program identifies specific general education courses that are needed. There's a reason for that. You know, there's a reason why a program will say instead of instead of taking any social or behavioral science, we want you to have sociology. There's a reason for that. But a lot of times neither the neither the career and technical program nor the liberal arts side communicates that to the student. You know, so the student is left wondering, is like, well, why am I in this class? You know, and there's no opportunity to then draw that connection. I think it does depend sometimes on, you know, the challenge for, you know, I think some, some disciplines are probably more challenged than others. You know, um, I would imagine that someone who's majoring, you know, well, I'll give you a better example. I once had a student tell me, who is in automotive technology that he hated mathematics and I was horrified. Mm -hmm. And I said, if that is the case, I don't want you anywhere near my car. 
you know. It's about making those connections at the community college. And I think sometimes we I think sometimes we struggle or we don't necessarily do the work that we can in order to bring those two areas, you know, you know together. Um, now, having said all of that, especially at the Indianapolis campus, and I would say this also applies to our partners in Bloomington and Lafayette, we have a lot of students who are pursuing degrees beyond the two-year level, and they are looking to transfer. And so then making sure that we are providing the strongest basis of, you know, of liberal arts education so that when they get to the four-year institution, they're well prepared. And I think we have the structure to do that because we don't have Psych 101 classes of 200 people. We don't have lectures of Biology 101 that are taught in large auditoriums. We have the opportunity to work more closely with our students, find out what their career goals are, and then have those conversations about how what they're taking in those classes fits within the bigger picture. So that's a fairly long answer. You know, don't get me started on the value of liberal arts education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We have just a couple minutes left. Any final questions? Last. Yes. Any final questions? Well, I want to thank, really, seriously, <laughs> I really want to thank so all of you for coming today. And for those of you watching, you know, remotely, this position really is, quite frankly, a dream position for me. Being a chief academic officer is something that I aspire to specifically. It is not just a matter of, I want to move up. I want to be an advocate. I want to be an advocate. I want to be a champion for the whole of academic affairs and all the students we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I want to be a collaborator with all of you who are ex outside of academic affairs for the benefit of the student experience. So with that, I will say thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the day.